time, I'm going to give a little background as to why our membership's here mainly this morning. When I, I'm often asked, well, uh, why is your membership in Florida when your primary residence is in West Virginia? Well, that's a good question. We have uh, been here almost five, well, we've been here five and a half months this year, so that leaves six and a half in the north, right? Uh, when we were in the north, I usually preach at least a third of the Sundays up there, so really, I can be more faithful here than I could be faithful to a church up there. So uh, that's one reason. Of course, there are other outlying reasons, but that is one reason. Uh, we used to stay in the fellowship hall over at uh, uh, Central Avenue Baptist Church in Tampa. Did that for years, even one winter after Brother Crow had been called home to be with the Lord, and uh, we began to pray and uh, discuss where we ought to go after the building over there was, was uh, uh, sold. Of course, we benefited from that sale here very much, as, as a lot of other churches did. So uh, we uh, knew other pastors in other areas. Uh, well, I won't go into that. But uh, we knew Brother Bourne over Plant City, and we knew Brother Bowen here, and we sort of wanted to change the pace, so uh, our favorite restaurant in all the world is Sweet Tomatoes. Any, anybody ever eaten at Sweet Tomatoes? You have to go to Orlando to eat there. We don't go there just to eat. But uh, I made a phone call to the motel out here right at 95, and they said, oh yeah, we've got a Sweet Tomatoes. <laughs> We got down here and we drove out here and it was a sweet tomatoes pizzeria. And boy, <laughs> our spirits fell. But we found the Golden Corral down at Palm Bay. But uh, that year that we uh, came over on uh, December 25th, 2011, we asked for church membership and it was graciously granted. And uh, we cherish the memories that we've had since then of being here. We knew the church preached truth, but I'm, we're not interested in uh, fleshly, uh, untruthful doctrine. Uh, we're interested in being a part of one of the Lord's true churches, properly organized. And we fell in, the lo in love with the people here. We also appreciate their missionary mindedness. They supported some of the same missionaries we led churches to support in years gone by. Just two other quick things. We also cherish the memory of some that have been called home to be with the Lord. Brother uh, Rewerts, did I say that almost right? Yeah, Met him once here in the services, and I think we went with Brother Bowen to visit him once or twice. But he was a, a wonderful uh, brother in the Lord. And then Sister... Uh, uh, Nalita Day, we had the privilege of holding her funeral here and of knowing her and visiting her often in the nursing home. And then one day, not long ago, <coughs> uh, our hearts were really thrilled when we heard, and I forget how we heard, probably Beverly got it on Facebook, about our little sister, Charity Deaner being saved by the grace of God. Amen. And we have certainly enjoyed watching, oh, there she is. I was looking for you back on the back. And uh, we've enjoyed watching her grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and using her voice, uh, beautiful voice that God's given her for his honor and his glory. Amen. So, if you, I'm, not, I'm not one to give good flower speeches, but it would, I could make it more flowery. <laughs> Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, may seem like an unusual message for a, an anniversary meeting, but you know, the names we put on things, even though they're correct, uh, doesn't necessarily dictate what we preach. We right. heard some excellent messages on uh, how we ought to live and uh, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. I'd like to bring a message that I bring, brought first of all in uh, uh, Hobbs, New Mexico, the Sunday after 9-11 happened on that Tuesday. And it's more about our nation, really, 
but it has some aspects dealing with uh, our churches too. I want to talk about the missing word. The missing word in all that was said surrounding 9-11 by our leaders. I never heard the word, we need to repent as a nation. Amen. But that was the word that was missing, and that's the word that's still missing, mm -hmm. and that's the word that's missing in most any church service that you will attend outside of Sovereign Grace Missionary Baptist Churches today. It is believe, 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 and that's fine. We must believe, more literally trust, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. But we must also be led of the Lord to repentance. Mm -hmm. Repentance doesn't begin with us right. any more than faith right. begins with us. Right. We can't repent until it's been granted to us. We can't believe until it's been given to us. Mm -hmm. Philippians 1 and verse 29. I wanted to simply read the first six verses, and we'll read uh, several more verses during the course of the message. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord say, Our messages must come from the Lord. Yeah. Our messages must be saturated with the word of the Lord. And here's that message to Israel through Jeremiah. Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Of course, these wheels were made of stone. We don't think of wheels of stone today, but I'll always remember, I suppose, the old grindstone that my dad uh, uh, sharpened up the side and other things on. That's what I think of when I think of that. It's like a big wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, he says, I'm talking personally to the house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? And he's saying the same thing to us this morning, individually, and as a church. Amen. We're the Lord's, Amen. and He can do with us whatsoever He wants to do with us. Behold, God says, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. I read on a verse or two. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from uh, against if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight that obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. We'll be using six or seven more verses, Lord willing, of that context uh, in the time to come. So any nation that has ever had an existence has had that existence because it was the will of God for them to come into existence. Mm -hmm. And it's the blessings of God upon us that we have remained a nation for all of these many, many years. And just as easily as God began our nation, He can pluck our nation down. Right. And just as simply as this church was first organized 25 years ago, if we turn from the truth, which I don't anticipate that, but if we turn from the truth, and I believe the whole counsel of God... Right. You can tell a lot about a church by just walking in the back door. You can tell a lot about the church in one service, but you can't tell everything about it until right. you hear the preaching of the Word. But God can pluck down just as easily <coughs> and quickly as He built up. Right. On September the 11th, 2001, I was pastoring in a little town called Hobbs, New Mexico, five miles west of the Texas border. 
I was on the telephone about, uh, I think it was 9 o'clock our time, and uh, trying to get insurance on our house that we live in now, which was rented at that time. Trying to get, and a lot of people, it was hard to get insurance when you rent a place. But uh, on that day, the lady asked me, she said, uh, have you heard what happened this morning? Of course, I hadn't. I hadn't had the TV on. Uh, maybe it was 9 o'clock there, I guess it was, and 7 o'clock back in Hobbs. So uh, she told me what had happened. And uh, we had experienced war from outside our country on our own soil. What a tragedy that seemed, and it was, on that day. It had been waged by terrorists, uh, Islamic terrorists. We're not ashamed to say the truth, even though our president is, and his Democratic Senate. Nevertheless, we believe in telling the truth. So, we were very upset over that, of course. And yet, we as a nation seemed unprepared to take any responsibility for what had happened. Some may here even say, you mean we had a responsibility in being attacked? Yes, we certainly did. Most Americans would stand in awe and wonderment of the statement that I've just made that we were somewhat responsible for that attack and subsequent attacks upon our freedom in this nation. Most Americans would ask what possible part could the United States of America have played in that terrorist attack. I believe we can get a lot of insight to answer that question by looking at God's national people of Israel. Let's read on down now, beginning at verse 10 through 17. It, or 11 through 17. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. That has to be our guide. And the guide of a nation, if we're going to have the blessings of God upon us. Behold, God says, I, notice the personal pronoun, notice who did this. Behold, I frame evil against you. Does God send that which is evil? He certainly does for the chastisement of his people. Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return, repent, that's what he's saying. Return you now, everyone, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, there is no hope. Now, if you haven't studied this, you probably disagree until you do, or until we read the rest of the part. But what they're saying is, Lord, there's no way we're going to do what you're telling us to do. We're not going to repent. There is no hope. There's no way. But we will walk. After our own devices, our nation has said that before the attack. Our nation has continued to say that after the attack. Right. And we will, they went on to say, we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. Therefore thus saith the Lord, ask ye now among the heathen who have heard such things, such things of their God, telling them, uh, if they would have or could have to repent in the nation not following. But yet, my people won't follow me, God says. The virgin of Israel hath done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rock of the field? Or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity, they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in paths in a way not cast up, to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing. Everyone that passeth by thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their Calamity. But the last verse we'll read, verse 18, what did they say? 
then said they come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. We don't want to hear what this man has to preach, has to tell us, whether it's from the Lord or whether it isn't from the Lord. Let's go and do something bad to him. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us smite him with the tongue. You know, sometimes that's worse than smiting with a rod, with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. How sad, and yet that's a picture of our great, beloved United States of America. Right. right after this happened, I think it was, if I'm wrong, help me out, right after this happened, uh, then we... Uh, we had elected a man who promised change, but nobody asked, sought to ask what kind of change he had in mind. But I want us to notice this morning three quick things. Uh, God's lamentation over Israel in the first place. And I would, uh, we've heard a little of that lamentation, but let's go back to uh, Jeremiah, the second chapter, and begin reading at verse 12. God says, has a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. Number one, they've forsaken me. We won't have time, I'm sure, to talk about how our nation has forsaken the Lord in a lot of ways, but, you know, they don't even want uh, children to pray in schools anymore. Right. But I would say to any young people here uh, that are in private uh, public schools, I don't think we have any, but uh, 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 no school, no president, nobody can ever keep you from praying because praying comes from the heart, it is a thought as well as expressing a word. So he says, They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and heard them out cisterns, broken cisterns. That's a vessel that holds water for our young people's sake. My dad had a cistern out behind the barn so that he could gather rainwater for the cattle in, in dry weather. And it wasn't the cleanest water because it came off the roof of the building, the barn. But nevertheless, it was water, and the cattle didn't mind a bit. So, broken cisterns. Now, verse 14, he says, Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? Uh, look at verse uh, uh, 17. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself, and that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way? And then verse 19. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. It's God's lamentation, but it's sent to the children of Israel through the prophet Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet. And he had a lot to weep about, didn't he? We have lots to weep about today because of the condition of many of the Lord's churches and of our nation, of our young people that not have, been, have not been properly trained in the things of the Lord and not been prayed with on a daily basis and not had the scriptures read to them on a daily basis. So if you're in a home that does have that, then you ought to be very, very thankful to the Lord who has given you such parents as that. Amen. Now, who would not weep with a message like ne uh, ne uh, Jeremiah had to deliver? Well, just as the Lord lamented over Israel, surely he laments over our nation today. I firmly believe with all of my heart one, if not the greatest, uh, reason the United States exists today 
is to be befriend, to be a friend to the nation of Israel, right. who are the people of God. We know how Israel was scattered because of their sins to every nation under the earth. We know how they were persecuted simply because they were Jews, and simply because, they, secondly, they belonged to the Lord as a nation. And uh, nobody but Bible believers ever thought they would have a nation to call their own. But we know in some of our lifetime, 1948, uh, God gave them to be a nation of people. Some are still scattered in various places, sending their livelihood back to uh, 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 Israel that they might continue on and be strong. So uh, not only does he... Uh, lament over our nation uh, for our proudness and for our uh, self-sufficiency and for our overly tolerance, uh, but he's made us to be the greatest and strongest nation in all the world. But I believe, and I believe you see it too, that our nation has begun towards being the tail instead of the head. You know, Israel was the head. God said, I'll make you the tail, if. And they, they did not, of course. And I believe I see America going downhill. Uh, seems like today we'd rather brag about our multicultural, cultural, cultural cur culture that we have in America today. And we would rather brag about our society and our tolerance to other nations and our power and our wealth rather than to give thanks to the God of heaven. Right. Yes. We depend upon we depend upon our strength. And where has our strength come from? It's come from God. Amen. Any strength we have comes from Almighty God. And surely God laments too over his churches. He sends his pastors to his churches with the inspired message. And quite often that message is not received. Certainly not received very well. But to these people says there are too many temptations. Too much good we like in this world. We will not return to God. Now let's notice for a very few minutes God's judgment upon them. The average person in America today would sneer at those of us who say that that attack was because, was the judgment of God upon our nation for having forsaken the Lord. Yet I believe that, and I think most of you here today would believe that, and I trust all of you would, because it is. Amen. It's God's judgment, judgment up on us. They say to us, oh, God wouldn't allow such a thing as that. God wouldn't do such a thing as that, even if he could. So they're casting uh, a poor reflection upon who God is and upon the power that he manifests. And uh, they insinuate in that statement that God isn't control, in control at all. In Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, at the 10th, uh, through the 12th verses we read, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. That word, uh, Lord there, Jehovah. He's Jehovah God. Amen. And he's an everlasting king. He's like the uh, priesthood that our Lord set up and is talked about in the book of uh, Hebrews. The Old Testament Levitical priesthood, they lived and they died and somebody took their place. Nobody will ever take the place of God because he is an everlasting king. I like that. He, he always has been king. He is king today and he ever will be king with a literal kingdom over which to reign. And then verse 11, that thus shall ye say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He that hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. 
God made it all. And God holds it all up. He sustains everything that he has made. Now this judgment was because of sin. Just the verses we've read already. Uh, they're the only ones we have time to go into at this time. But uh, their sins, this judgment came because of their sins. Just to give you uh, a few of them, they, they desired their sins. Uh, they were an ungrateful people. They were idolaters. Uh, we've brought out the word forsaken used three times there in three or four verses in chapter 2. And uh, they were an immoral people. Uh, they were irrational in their thinking and also in their actions. And they denied their sins. They fa failed to recognize God's chastening hand. And they forgot the Lord. And sadly, they taught others their own wickedness to forget the Lord. Now, this could be a message in itself. Mm -hmm. But secondly, this judgment didn't come without exhortation to repent. You'll notice in chapter 3 that again we'll not turn to, but the entire third chapter speaks about repentance. Only acknowledge your sins. And uh, I have written 1 John 1 9 because he tells us as his people the same thing in 1 John 1 and verse number 9. So you'll note uh, that these sins which prompted God's judgment of old are the very same sins that plague America today. Immorality. Why it's nothing thought of today. Right. Baptist churches will even receive members into their... Now, we would not. Uh, our kind of Baptist, Baptist in name, they do, though, just as they do receive a baptism that's not really a baptism. But all of these things are the same things that are happening in our land today. And when these sins are allowed to go on, we give the idea and we actually make the statement, we know better than God. We know better than what Jeremiah was told by God to do. Well, I've got to get to the third point because that's the main thrust of the message. Uh, my old pastor used to say there are two kinds of preachers. One that has to look for something to say and one that has something must be said. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've got more that must be said this morning than I can probably say because I'm looking forward to Brother France preaching after one. I want us to look at, make some observations now about what happened on 9-11-01 and what happened with Israel and how the Lord judged and how He's going to judge America. In light of His dealings with Israel, and what happened, <clears throat> what shall we expect, expect? Well, his judgment, if we do not repent. Right. And then, what did happen? Well, there are four things here. There was a call to patriotism. Do you remember that? Yeah. We all sat glued to the TV and we watched, and there was a call to patriotism. And I think American people ought to be patriotic yeah. or to leave the country. I don't say we have to be in love with the leaders when they're not in love with God, but we need to love America. Right. And we need to go to the polls and express our love for America, not to somebody who will take care of our pocketbooks, but for somebody who will stand for the truth and the Bible and the God of the Bible. Amen. And I think you can figure that one out very easily. So why was patriotism mentioned and it hadn't been emphasized for years upon years? Well, it's like people come forward to, they say, rededicate their lives. You never see them again. Did they rededicate their lives? No. If they did, to whom? <laughs> Not to God. To themselves, maybe. But uh, our leaders, many of them, have heretofore voted against legislation that would have made it uh, against the law to desecrate our flag. Somebody says, well, what's so great about the flag? It stands for what we stand for. It's an emblem that shows that we stand for, just as the Pledge of Allegiance. We're one nation under God, you see. Right. And for a while that was 
maybe taken out, but they wanted to. So for several years, they had sent the message to our young people that it was okay to burn old glory. Now all of a sudden, we, got, we want to be patriotic. And that just showed the hypocrisy of our elected officials. And I don't speak 100%, of 100% of our elected officials, but I, I sadly do speak of the majority of our elected officials. Then the second thing, the call, there was a call to prayer. You remember that, I'm sure. A call to prayer is good. But again, it shows the ignorance of our uh, leaders regarding spiritual things. In the past, they've not deemed it important for certain people to pray in certain places. But all of a sudden, this was a time to pray. Well, the time to pray was before this ever happened. And then our leaders reason that God is obligated. And any way we, anytime we say God's obligated... We're in trouble immediately. Amen. God's not obligated to do anything, but He will do what He said He will do. Amen. So uh, our, our, our leaders reason that God's obligated to hear, hear the prayer. Well, let's look. I must read a few verses in chapter 7 at verses 16 to 18. Uh, Therefore pray not for this people, the Lord told Jeremiah. You know, that's the first thing we think of, pray for somebody. Well, it may not be the best thing to do. That God may be chastening that per person, and if he is, he'll continue to chasten them until he brings them about. So he says, I will not hear thee. You can pray, but I won't hear you. In verse 16, somebody says, that sounds like a strange God. Our God is an unusual God. He's only one like him, Amen. and he's the only true and living God. And then verse 17 says, The reason I won't hear you is because uh, seest thou know not what they do in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. The children gather wood. That's fine. The fathers kindle the fire. That's fine. The women knead their dough. That's fine. But why do they do it? To make cakes to the queen of heaven, to a false deity, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. That's not the only passage that tells us not to pray in the book of Jeremiah. But we move on. Our leaders fail to understand that there's but one true God. Now we know there's only one true God. How do we know that? We know it from the inspired word of Amen. God. I often wonder why people don't know more than they do know about the things of God. Well, they don't read God's book. They just take what some preacher tells them or what they read, which is not very much. So, uh, I remember expressly, and this, this might, you might get on my case a little, but this is the truth. I voted for the Bushes four times. But I thought our last, Mr. Bush's, two, two last years, I thought they were a disaster. That's right. yes. You may not agree with me, but I thought they were a disaster. Yes. So it's not just Democrat, Republican, although it usually is. One's liberal in their platform, one's conservative in their platform. But they don't always act as their platform. But I remember distinctly, and I wrote it down, Mr. Bush said, go to your church, your synagogue, your mosque, and pray. Anybody else remember hearing that? Yes. I'm glad you do, because I know he said it. I, I went right and wrote it down, because I knew I was going to preach this, Lord willing, the next Sunday morning. So, uh, uh, we've uh, been asked to pray for any God of our making. Right. But i got to move along. I'm just about through. Our leaders don't know that God only hears his elect. The sinner can't pray, but the time he prays, he's not a lost sinner anymore. He's been regenerated by the power of God. That's why he calls out to God. And of course, Matthew 6, the Lord taught his disciples how to pray. And then these don't know that God won't hear prayer when there's unrepented sin. That's true with the nation. That's true with the church. Remember when Joshua uh, and the people went up to Ai? They said, oh, they're just a few people. We don't need to take many with us. Uh, we'll just take a few. And they took about, what was it, 3,000? 
Anyway, 36 of them were killed, and the rest of them ran. <laughs> they retreated. And Joshua comes home, and he falls on his face, and he says, Lord, what has happened? And then uh, in verse number 10, I believe it is, of Joshua 7, he says, Get up from off your face. Israel has sinned. So there's a time to do instead of pray. Then the last thing, it's been promised, or it was promised, that we will annihilate, we will eliminate these terrorists and their helpers. I was 100% for that. I'm still 100% for that right. today. But when a nation, you know, we, wanna, we want people to think we are really a rich nation. How can you be rich and owe 20 or is it 21 trillion dollars now in debt? We're not a rich nation. We are bankrupt. We, uh, we have to borrow money to send to Iran 150 billion with a B so they'll tell us they won't go ahead and get a nuclear bomb. Now, is that crazy? Amen. I've never heard of such a thing as that. I've never heard of a law, and why the Congress and Senate allows this, I don't know unless they're just in cahoots. I don't understand. But this is an arrogant statement that we will do something. You know what God honors? He honors humility. Mm -hmm. Well, I've given you some broken pieces of a message that I would probably have preached in two parts. But nevertheless, it, a lot of it would have been the same thing because we'd be reading the same thing in different passages in the book of Jeremiah. But keep in mind, there is a missing word in churches, in governments. We must repent in order to have the favor of Almighty God. Thank you very much. Amen.